Um, okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present my work today. Um, as was mentioned, uh, we work on the design and development of self-assembling antimicrobial nanostructures and materials. So for those of you who don't know, in 2014, the World Health Organization declared that we are on the brinks of the post-antibiotic era, an era in which minor cuts and bruises, which are now easily dealt with with classical antibiotics, will once again become life-threatening. And this is due to the proliferation of drug-resistant bacteria, as well as the fact that over the past 30 years or so, there haven't really been any new developments in the field of new antibiotic moieties. So how do we step back from this post antibiotic era? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is stewardship. And the second thing is the development of new antimicrobial agents. So a promising class of new antimicrobial agents are actually antimicrobial peptides. So they're part of our innate immune system. They're found amongst all classes of life. And they are made up of various different sequences and structures. So how do these peptides differ from classical antibiotics that you all are familiar with? Well, classical antibiotics target a very specific bacterial enzyme, or an active site, to be precise, whereas antimicrobial peptides target the bacterial membrane on a whole, on a biochemical and biophysical manner. And this is something that is very hard to acquire resistant to, because that would be the equivalent of asking us to change the composition of our skin. Now, about 10 years or so, researchers in the field of antimicrobial peptides actually noticed that these peptides form amyloid-like fibers, and they're functional <laughs> in this amyloid-like state. And very briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar, amyloids are these proteinaceous assemblies formed by different proteins and peptides, which we can see here in the electron micrograph, which comes, stems from this very specific ultrastructure. Now, amyloids have gotten a bad name in terms of neurodegeneration. But actually, nature has been using functional amyloids for various different applications. Humans, for example, have a very important functional amyloid called PML17, which is actually crucial for melanin synthesis. So as I mentioned before, classical antimicrobial peptides have been, formed, have been found to form these amyloid-like structures. And these structures are actually the state in which these peptides are functional. The other side to this is that classical amyloids, such as A-beta, implicated in Alzheimer's disease, IAPP, implicated in type 2 diabetes, prion, point, prion protein, and serum amyloid A, to name a few, actually have potent antimicrobial activity. And if we look at the structure and the sequences of classical antimicrobial peptides, we can actually see relatively high abundance of aromatic amino acids, which you can see here in gray. And this is something that we find really interesting because our lab has been dealing with the significance of aromatic amino acids to self-assembly for close to two decades now. So when we look at all of this data, we begin to understand that these two distinct classes of proteins and peptides, amyloids and antimicrobial peptides, might not be so distinct. We begin to understand that there might be some interplay between self-assembly and antimicrobial activity. And that is what my PhD work focuses on this interplay between these two phenomena. So how do you start beginning to understand the significance of self-assembly to antimicrobial activity? Well, we knew that we wanted minimal models that lacked the structure and the interpretation of some of these larger proteins and peptides that people had been working with. So we screened the sequences of various amyloidogenic proteins and peptides, such as amyloid beta, IPP, and alpha-synuclein, just to name a few. And we were looking for minimal models which, on the one hand, self-assemble, and we wanted to evaluate their antimicrobial activity. So we have a few really interesting hits, but what I'm going to be showing to you today is the antimicrobial activity of diphenylalanine, which is the core recognition motif of amyloid beta implicated in Alzheimer's disease. So the first thing that we did was look at the antimicrobial activity of these peptides against E. coli. And why did we choose E. coli? Naturally, it's a very easy a pathogen to work with, but actually the resistance of E. coli is growing rapidly around the world, and it is the cause of bloodstream and urinary tract infections. Now what is important to remember when we're dealing with E. coli is that we actually have an outer membrane, a periplasmatic space, an inner membrane, and only the, the cytoplasm itself. So the first thing that we did was treat E. coli bacteria with nanostructures that were formed by diphenylalanine. And you can see here complete inhibition of bacterial growth. What you can see here in the lighter red is treatment of these bacteria with diphenylalanine 
at the same concentration, but that hadn't undergone nanostructure formation. So we see that at the same concentration, samples that had undergone nanostructure formation were able to inhibit bacterial growth, but samples that had not were able to inhibit, but to a far less substantial extent than that that we saw from the nanostructures formed by diphenylalanine. And throughout this evaluation, we were looking at diglycine, a dipeptide that does not self-assemble as a control. And we can see that bacteria treated by diglycine proliferate and grow just as the control do. So the next question that we wanted to ask was, are we actually killing bacteria or are we only inhibiting their growth? And to do that, we utilized two fluorescent dyes, Cyto9, which you can see in green, which is indicative of live bacteria, and Propidium iodide, which is indicative of, red, of dead bacteria stained in red. We can see that after 24 hours, you see complete proliferation of the control bacteria, but even after a single hour, we see that there is no proliferation of diphenylalanine treated bacteria, and we actually see bacterial cell death, which consists for 24 hours. So the next thing that we wanted to ask was how are we killing these bacteria? As I mentioned before, antimicrobial peptides affect the bacterial membrane. And what we see here in these really nice micrographs of bacteria treated with the diphenylalanine nanostructures, numerous snicks and tears, you can actually see holes in the bacterial membrane, a lot of membrane thinning, membrane fusion, and lysis of the bacteria. So we had some kind of indication that we're able to kill bacteria and this somehow affects their morphology. But in order to get a better understanding of the effect of these nanostructures, we utilized two assays. First one is ANS, which is a fluorescent dye, which has an increase in its fluorescent yield when there's outer membrane permeation. And the second, DISC35, which has a similar increase upon inner membrane depolarization, so it's a potentiometric dye. We can see that upon treatment with the nanostructures, we see significant outer membrane permeation and very rapid and persistent inner membrane depolarization. So to complement these types of analysis, we wanted to look at stress response regulants. We wanted to ask the bacteria, what do you feel when we treat you with these nanostructures? And what we could see was substantial upregulation of some pretty interesting stress response regulants such as SOX and SPI, which are indicative of the formation of reactive oxygenative species, MGTA, which is kind of master regulator of stress in E. coli, KDP, which is indicative of inner membrane depolarization, and OSMB and BDM, which is indicative of outer membrane perturbations. So the next thing that we wanted to do was evaluate the biocompatibility of these nanostructures. We can see that they are non-cytotoxic towards HEC 293 cells and HEC gut cells, and they do not cause red blood cell lesions. And the next thing that we wanted to do was to utilize these nanostructures for various biomedical applications. And the first one that I'm going to be showing you here today is the use of them in tissue scaffolds. So we are inserting them into the agar gelatin tissue scaffold and trying to grow bacteria on the scaffold itself. And what we can see is that we, there's complete proliferation of bacteria over 24 hours of growth. But on the scaffolds that have been incorporated with these nanostructures, we do not see any growth at all. So to conclude, um, we have used a minimal model of amyloids, and we have been able to decipher its mechanism of action, and we show that it actually causes outer membrane permeation, inner membrane depolarization, and these nicks and tears that you saw in the micrographs, which inevitably bring about bacterial cell death. And this is something that was pretty cool, was very well um, received within the antimicrobial community. This paper came out about a year ago, and what's been really satisfying for me to see is that the last few months have actually seen a lot of follow-up on this work, so people have been utilizing different minimal systems, so not these large antimicrobial peptides, not these large amyloids, but very minimal building blocks, and evaluating their effect, their antimicrobial capabilities, I'm really beginning to see kind of an establishment of the significance of self-assembly to antimicrobial activity. And people have, begin to, have begun to utilize this for various applications. And we're doing that as well in collaboration with the Adela Bomovich group in the School of Dentistry. Um, we, sorry, we're working to develop antimicrobial dental materials. And why would you need antimicrobial dental materials? Well, dental caries, or tooth decay, are actually one of the most common maladies that we see um, in humans in general, it's about 60% of school children, the vast majority of adults have some form of tooth decay. And this tooth decay is actually caused by the acidic 
um, formation due to the fermentation of gram-positive bacteria such as strep mutans. Nowadays, if you go to your dentist with a dental carry, you'll probably fill that with some kind of resin composite material, as you can see here. Now, secondary tooth decay at the, at the restoration site is actually very common. And this is what brings about the need for root canal treatment and possibly the actual extraction of the tooth itself. So the idea is to mitigate this effect and to actually make antimicrobial dental materials. So what we were using here is different nano assemblies. This time we're using FMOC pentafluoroalanine, which forms nanostructures that are very different in nature than what you saw to diphenylalanine. What you see are these beautiful, elongated, very, very flexible fibers. And their biophysical characteristics are actually very important to the application that we're using. So one of the things that the flexibility and the length of these nanostructures allows us is to homogeneously incorporate them into these resin composite materials. The other thing, and I cannot stress this enough, before these materials need to be antimicrobial, they are restoratives in your teeth. They need to be formidable. They need to be strong. And we need to have no or virtually no effect on the optical properties of these materials. These are going to restorations in teeth that you can see. So we see that the insertion or the incorporation of these nano assemblies does not affect the mechanical strength of these enhanced materials, and it does not affect their optical properties as well. What it does affect is the antimicrobial activity of these enhanced materials. We can see substantial cell death um, with a very low loading dosage. This is something about half to five times less than what you usually see for kind of the state of the art in the field, which is, has got us um, and quite a few dentists very excited about this. And of course, we also evaluate the biocompatibility, and we see that they're relatively biocompatible as well. So this is ongoing, and I'd be happy to talk to you about the project. Um, but just to summarize, I want to say that we've moved kind of from a basic understanding of the significance or the possible significance of self-assembly to antimicrobial activity to actually utilizing these self-assembling moieties for the reformation of enhanced biomedical materials. That, I would like to thank Udi and Lee and all of our collaborators um, the funding, and thank you for listening. Questions to Lee? Any mechanistic idea? Why does it affect just the bacteria, those bacteria, and not uh, humans' uh, uh, yes. mem cell membranes? So there's, there's two notions to this. The first one is that the bacterial membrane is more fluid than the uh, human membrane. Um, so that could be one aspect, and the other thing is that the bacterial cell membrane is negatively charged, whereas the human cell membrane is um, sort of to a certain degree. So we think it has to do, at least in the aspect of classical antimicrobial peptides, people talk about biochemically um, targeting of um, the, the charge and biophysical targeting of the abil this ability to self-assemble into a membrane that is more fluid. Um, the data points to that as well, but I have to say that we, as well as the whole community of antimicrobial peptides, haven't been able to pinpoint exactly what that is. People talk about charge and fluidity, but it's not 100% understood. Any more questions? Thank you, Lee. Fascinating talk.